within any given chain of logical explanation, the links need not be all of the same logical kind. Uh, I may offer a material statement as a sufficient reason for the truth of another material statement. But if repeatedly challenged, um, I shall be pushed back to empirical statements. And if challenged further, to causal statements. Further, the line of explanation can go back and forth in either direction. Uh, I can explain something either by showing how it is put together internally or by showing how it connects up externally. And this is very important now. I kind of like this point. Maybe we can start a discussion here. For instance, if someone were to ask me how a carburetor works, I could answer him in, I could answer him in one of two ways. The first, either by explaining what its components are and how they go together to make up the carburetor, or the second by explaining what a carburetor's function is in the internal combustion engine and how it thus helps drive the car. Taken in isolation, the question, how does a carburetor work, that's terribly ambiguous. So obviously from here we can derive either direction. We can tell you, um, you could either answer it again, or simply I suppose, uh, what it's made of, or you could go the other direction and um, this, use this as the explanation instead of what it's made of, um, how it contributes to making up the grander picture. Uh, you either move up, out, or in, inward. Alrighty, um, the traditional and familiar terms of these two opposite directions of explanation are analysis and synthesis. At first sight, it seems obvious that a full explanation of anything would need to be double-barreled in the sense of including both. But as soon as we pursue any such full explanation, we run into a paradox. Every explanation I give of anything can be challenged, and an explanation, what we might call explanation two, can be demanded of the terms of explanation one. In meeting this demand, I am compelled to introduce new terms, uh, otherwise explanation two is circular. But, that means that an explanation 3 can then be demanded in terms of my explanation 2 of what I said in explanation 1. Um, so, in analysis at least, we can obviously, um, this can obviously go on to infinity. This being so, uh, only one of two things can happen. Either I, and others, will continue adding explanation to explanation without end, or depending on the practical needs of the situation, such as the satisfaction or exhaustion of my hearer's curiosity, I will stop somewhere. In either case, my explanation will be incomplete. In the former case, by definition, and in the latter case, at the point at which I stop. I am using explanatory terms which are not themselves explained. Thus, the nature of explanation is such that any explanation of anything is necessarily and always incomplete. In practice, we can be satisfied, but in theory, never. In practice, our wants and our curiosity are nearly always limited. Either they have a specific object which achieves satisfaction whereupon they wane, or else they grow stale and then seek a change of focus. If neither of these things happens, and our wants and curiosity go on not being satisfied, a point is reached when we begin to feel that life will become intolerably frustrating unless we learn to accept this withholding from us something which, it seems, we are not going to get. And at that point, we usually try to force ourselves to stop demanding. The adaptive mechanism at work is at bottom biological. Curiosity that persists beyond it is rare. Of its nature, curiosity is bound to be strong and likely to be disconcerted, perhaps even to the point of distress, but disconcerted or not, it constitutes a drive so powerful that, precisely because it cannot be satisfied, the life of anyone who feels it cannot but be driven by it.